Thank you. Does, let's see, can I walk around? Looks good, okay. Um, thank you for having me here, uh, Jorge. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again in the Basque country. Um, it's a great country, um, and we just love our partnership. Uh, this is my fourth time being here, and the first time I think I had uh, a group of ladies with me that worked with me on President Obama's Advanced Manufacturing Steering Committee uh, that we called uh, uh, the, um, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of them right now, but they, they were a great group of ladies, and it was really interesting to have all of these ladies that um, all were working in manufacturing, so I kind of want to point to that. Um, so if you could change to the, okay, here we go. Thank you. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story first, and then we'll get to kind of the end of the story with the two pictures here. So um, I am a product of the American Community College, and I kind of want to help you understand what that means. Because in the United States, a community college is a little bit different than a vocational school or a T school here in, um, in Europe. So the community college, can you hear me now? Sounds like Verizon. Okay, so I want to tell you a story about me because I'm a product of the American Community College, and it'll be important for you to understand. So I am not someone that graduated high school, the American high school general education system, and go on to a university. I didn't do that. I went to General Motors, and I actually built cars. I worked on the production line. I assembled gas tanks. I assembled and disassembled motors, engines to cars. And I saw the rise and the fall of General Motors. And I married my husband. Uh, we grew up together, but we were kids, and we went into GM together. And we got married, and we started having children. And things changed for GM, as you all know. They started going broke. And then I would get laid off, and then my husband would get laid off. And we sat at the American dinner table, and we said, can we do this? Can we retire from GM? And maybe somebody has to go back to school. And so we did like most people would do. My husband, Jeff, he stayed and he worked. And I went to an American community college. I went to Lansing Community College in Lansing, Michigan. And I decided, what can I do with um, myself? I work at GM, what do I study? And so I said, okay, I like to draw things. I was an artist in high school. So I went into industrial drafting. And so I ended up, as I got more and more educated, designing machines for the auto industry. Doesn't sound like a girl, huh? But it worked out pretty good. And um, so my faculty in the administration at Lansing Community College, they watched me and they said, wow, she's pretty good. So they hired me as a student employee and I went all the way from a student employee to a person that was appointed to the administration to build a new campus for General Motors, okay? So all things are possible in, in the American community college system. Community colleges um, are considered higher ed. That's what's different maybe a little bit from what I was hearing from the European Union yesterday. Um, so we're all in higher ed. So how do you know a community college from a college? Because you could have a four-year elite liberal arts school be called a college, and then you could have a community college. It'll have the name community in it. And what that means is you support your community, your regional community. I work with the employers in my community as the president of South Central. I I raise funds for South Central. I work with politicians in support of South Central College at the local, state, and federal level. Um, I am the face of that institution. Um, we make sure that the employers are engaged and in the building. Um, if a new, uh, someone was talking yesterday 
about um, Amazon picking 200 communities to move into. Um, if they were picking my community, I would be meeting with my local chamber of commerce and the site selectors to let them know that the education that they'll need for their plant would be available in my community. And so that's kind of the work of an American community college. There's three stools, and then I'll move on. I call it a three-legged stool. It's a chair, right, with three legs. One is liberal arts education. That is your general education that is the first two years of a bachelor degree. Then you offer what we call now, we used to call vocational education, we call career and technical education. And then there's workforce development. And that's the part that I heard the Europeans saying we want to develop further. And that's where I train businesses. I, I have a whole department that just goes out to businesses, ask them what they need, and deliver that training. And so I'll talk more about that um, now that you understand the American Community College. So I started out building this plant for GM and, uh, in Lansing, Michigan. And it was really exciting because we got to lead the launch of that plant because we had the skill set to do that. Um, it was actually two plants. It was a Cadillac plant and uh, a plant that builds uh, Buicks and Chevrolets. Um, and they were the two newest plants in North America. And everyone was wondering, when we built this plant, we had amazing partnerships inside of it, and everybody said, how did you do that? So people from all over the country were coming to look at this campus we built and how we organized it. And uh, Toyota came up from Kentucky one day, and they looked at it, and they said, Annette, please come to Kentucky and help build a national center of excellence in advanced automotive manufacturing. And so I moved on to Kentucky, and um, we built a national center of excellence with, um, in about 14 uh, states uh, in the southeast and the midwest of the United States, um, with 35 assembly plants um, throughout those states. And we were working on curriculum in mechatronics and tool and die. And that uh, center of excellence got a lot of attention. Um, I was invited by Hillary Clinton to go to India, um, China, Germany, and other places. And I had never dreamed that I'd ever do that, let alone one day someone called and said, hey, are you interested in a president in Minnesota? And so I said, well, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And off I went. Um, as president of South Central College. And about three months in, wait, well, let me back up just a moment. While I was in Kentucky, I got to take that first picture on the left. President Obama was coming through Ohio um, on a campaign. He's at a high school in Lima, Ohio. Uh, and um, I was working with the Chrysler plant in Ohio and uh, if you remember, if you watch our politics, hopefully you haven't watched them lately, um, uh, Mitt Romney was running against him, and Mitt Romney said that this Chrysler plant was gonna close, and I was working with the workers at Chrysler, and it was not true. And so he came there, and the guys at Chrysler told me, we're gonna get Obama, and I says, if you do, you gotta get me in. And so they got me in, and I was in the front row. And so as I was in the front row, he always comes off the stage and he walks around, and the Secret Services are all around him, these guys that protect him, and they're pushing the cameras down. You can't take a picture of him. He puts his hands out, and you can touch his hands. And so he put one hand out, and I grabbed it. And, and then he put the other hand out, and my husband's right here. He put this on this side. And I grabbed that one, too. And then Obama laughed at me. And, and uh, my husband grabbed his wrist. I said, Jeff, you're going to get killed. 
<laughs> you know. And so I, I just kind of wanted to tell you that because that was the first time I saw him. And Ohio is always the place that they're all at at the last minute because they say as, as Ohio goes, so goes the United States. And so as we're headed home, here comes Mitt Romney's um, motorcade uh, coming the other direction. But that was the first time I met him. And then on the right, I um, am outside the White House after our last meeting on his committee. And they took our cameras inside, and so I, that was the only picture I could get. Um, but I did get to spend about 90 minutes with the president, and uh, it was wonderful, as you could imagine. So I then learned how to do this. When Obama comes to town, how do I get a picture? And I'm, I'm, I changed this PowerPoint last night because I wanted you guys to see uh, the first speaker showed uh, everybody trying to take a selfie with uh, Hillary Clinton. So here you go. Whoops. <laughs> and so I got to tell you the story about this because it's even funnier than it appears. Um, I was, uh, he, he came to St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, the other guy to my uh, right is uh, another president in St. Paul, at St. Paul College. And we both got invited to the front line. And I knew that they're going to push the cameras down. So I told someone, take my phone, and when he comes around, take my picture, and I'll turn around. <laughs> and that's what happened. So, you know, I just wanted to, to trump that other, uh, oh, that's a bad word. I just wanted to um, kind of uh, address that other selfie with Hillary. Um, and so I looked hard to find that last night. My husband says it looks like I'm picking his pocket. <laughs> OK? So let's talk a little bit about President Obama's work, because it's going to set up how is the United States addressing these issues. I think I have to go back. So, in, um, I had just become president of South Central College in um, July of 2013, but you can see that he released a press release in, on September 26 of 2013 that says he's launching the Advanced Manufacturing Steering Committee. And he set up five work groups, and I led uh, the one that's bold, the demand-driven work, uh, workplace solutions. Um, and uh, with uh, the CEO of uh, Siemens North America. And uh, we looked at strategies about how is the United States going to continue to be competitive in advanced manufacturing. Um, and I just want to set up, but now we're going to talk about some other things that were coming. And so the president is looking at the fact uh, back in 2013 that we're not going to have the workforce that we need for the future in advanced manufacturing, but also in a lot of other places, okay? So let's continue with this storm. So what's going on in the United States is, is you have a lot of associations working with employers. These are employer-driven organizations that are driving standards for the workforce, for the workers of the future. So um, the one that's titled MSSC, is the Manufacturing Skills Standards Council, okay? And President Obama asked for a million new workers to be certified with industry-recognized credentials. That's what all of these are, are different organizations that are driving standards. The SME is the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, okay? And so this all was starting Oh, maybe even back in 2010 or earlier. Then you have philanthropic organizations in the United States that um, are um, really giving to community colleges to drive certain efforts. And this is just a, a, a small list of them. These are the ones that we're involved with at South Central College in Minnesota. but. Um, you can see that these are um, organizations that provide additional revenue to drive change in the community college. The community colleges 
um, started off, my school started in 1946 as a vocational technical school. And in 2005, it became comprehensive, which meant it offered the transfer curriculum to the four year. And so it was changing. And that's when we got in the 97, Bill Clinton uh, talked about a nation at risk, which drove us to change our name and move from CTE to, I'm sorry, from vocational to CTE, career and technical education. And so I have a campus foundation that raises, uh, you know, they have uh, several million dollars um, and they give scholarships to students, they buy equipment. The state of Minnesota matches those equipment. Um, and other foundations and institutes that are driving change, and I'll talk more about that. You can see the Gates Foundation, very involved in two-year institutions. And so here's the next thing that came up. Um, after President uh, Obama's steering committee meeting uh, here, we released a report at the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The National Science, uh, the National um, um, Association of Science, Engineering, and Medicine um, was founded in the 1860s by Abraham Lincoln, to, and it's a non governmental, nonpartisan research arm. And it brings in scientists, engineers, and specialists um, from all over the country to uh, provide data to uh, the country and to the um, Congress. Um, so we um, went there right after and released this report. Um, since then, I got very engaged with the National Academies um, and we released this report here, Building America's Skilled Technical Workforce. And it talked about the issues and how we had to prepare for a future workforce for the United States. I want you to know if you go to the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, there's reports you could download. Um, it's amazing research um, at any time from anywhere in the world. Uh, we looked at indicators for monitoring undergraduate STEM education. So you could see that America's really looking at how are we going to do this? We've got a perfect storm arising. Um, the American Association of Community Colleges, which is a member organization that supports all 1,106 community colleges in the United States, uh, released the 21st Century Initiative Report, which talked about the issues that community colleges need to, to address if we were gonna be prepared for this perfect storm. So, the last report that um, I've been involved with with the National Academies is um, the um, National Academy of Engineering Study of Workforce Adaptability. So you call it Industry 4.0, and we're calling it the adaptability of our workforce. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. It's three things that we think were important from this report. And it's important to know that when they set up these committees, we had the social scientists on it, uh, with amazing education and background. We had engineers, we had people on the ground like me, so that it had to be a very diverse group. Everything had to be driven by data, and, we, and this report you can also get online. But it talked about we have to be adaptable. They're gonna be able to adjust to new conditions, okay? They have to be agile, the power of moving quickly and easily and being nimble. You've seen a lot the last two days that uh, gets to this very point. And then they have to be resilient. So if they make a mistake, if they have a difficulty, they have to be able to rebound. Um, I wanna tell you a story because I said that I was a designer, right? on the computer-aided drafting systems. And back in the uh, late 80s when I was doing that, I was on a system called CADM 
that had a mainframe computer that was probably in an eight by 10 foot room that did all the processing. I could probably do it on my iPhone now. Um, but I uh, had a conversation with the, um, the, the guy that created Stratasys, Stratasys 3D printers. And we were, we were just chatting over dinner and he said, you know, he says, he and I started both on this CAD system. And I can remember, I used to draw things and, you know, for people that didn't understand blueprints, I would make a perspective view of this table here so that you could understand what you're looking at. And he decided, oh, I'm gonna put something in your hand, okay? Uh, today, because of that training, I can get a new app on my iPhone and I adjust, I adapt. And then I'll think of different ways to use it very resiliently. My husband, I have to take his phone and do his update for him. Okay? And so how are we going to make sure that our workforce can adapt? Those skills that they gave me back then have led me to my career today and has led me into this room today, which was unbelievable. I told you my story. But it was resiliency. It was using the basic skills that I learned in a vocational school, if you want to call it that, in Lansing, Michigan. And then adapting that to every new situation and being resilient to see it through. So what are community colleges doing? I'm gonna take a high level view nationally and then go down to Minnesota and then to South Central College and apply it. So we're talking about career and guided pathways. Our students, because we're open access, they come into the community college and if there's going, they say, most of them say, I'm gonna transfer to Minnesota State University and I want a four year degree. Doesn't mean they're gonna finish that. And I always say, we need to make sure they don't get lost along the way. So let's give them pathways to follow so that they know when they come in the door, we don't lose them and they're following their path. We had to look at developmental education redesign. I heard the uh, EU yesterday talk about people that are illiterate. The American Community College is open access. Anybody can come to our doors and we will take them in. And sometimes they have not learned much in high school and we have to help them. And so that's what we call developmental education. And we are looking at strategies about how do we help them get to college level work so that they can get a skill and get a job. Um, industry recognized credentials, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Credit for prior learning. And it doesn't matter where the learning happened. If it happened on the job, and you can assess that, give them credit. Why should they take another course? Work-based learning and apprenticeships. We're learning from you. Um, innovative learning platforms, I'm gonna talk about that, plus connect, I have an example a little later that I'll show you, and then non-credit to credit pathways. And what I mean by that is, as I mentioned, the three-legged stool of the American Community College, where we go out into employers and we offer training to their workforce. Well, that's non-credit, and through credit for prior learning, if we know that someone else taught them, give them that credit and allow them to move on. And so I'm gonna go a little more in depth in the, to those strategies when I get down to my campus. Um, so we look at how do we redesign education um, for, to support students. And so in 2000, uh, community colleges were taking huge heat, a lot of heat from the federal government and from state governments because we had so many people coming into our institutions because it's open door 
that are not ready to learn. And so how do we help more students be successful? We had to redesign that. And so it became the completion agenda. It's what you'll hear a lot of American um, administrators in higher ed talk about, the completion agenda. And only community college, the most elite, you know, so-called elite learners go to the universities. We take everybody. So we were getting the heat and we were the only ones to really say we got to reinvent ourselves and um, support a success agenda. And that's where the guided pathways come from. So you're having pathways, you help them financially plan because they're paying part of their tuition in the United States, uh, credit for prior learning, you're seeing all of this. This is an organization called Achieving the Dream. And I got a couple schools here that are achieving the dream schools. Um, the, the really good schools in the United States uh, have been involved with Achieving the Dream for some time now and they're called lead schools, and they're closing the gap of the people that come into their doors and can't get out. So then I talked about career pathways, I'll kind of go around this, but one thing I will say about it is how do you intrusively advise students? You can't just let them come in, you gotta have advisors that are following them and say, hey Annette, uh, you didn't take this course, you need to take this course. Okay? So a little bit about Minnesota State. The Minnesota State system is a system of 24 community colleges and seven universities. Um, and we served 396,000 students this last year in the state of Minnesota. 260,000 of them were for credit. So think of the 18 to 22 year old or the 16 to 20 year old that's coming in to a VET school. That's really mostly that population, but they could be older because they can walk in at any time. They could be someone that retired from a job and now wants to learn some other things and, and open their own business. 136,000 of them are the ones that we go into the businesses and support. And we make sure that our institutions are located around the state. It's hard to see, um, Minnesota is a kind of a lot of land mass. Um, we, um, it's a uh, little over five, well, five and a half million people in the state of Minnesota. Um, and we've got 58% of the state covered uh, with, um, we have 133,000 what we call underrepresented students. Those are the ones I talked about. They're at most at risk. That means they're the, they're the first person in their family to go to school, to higher ed. They may be a student of color, or they're low income. That's underrepresented. Those are our most at-risk population. And remember, we're all trying to figure out how to address that. Of those 50,000 are first generation, so no one in their families ever received a higher education degree. And 10,500 are veterans of the US Armed Forces. So, uh, we're in, our campuses are in 47 communities across the state. And some of our campuses are very small with only 445 students and some are very large. So we also have centers of excellence um, that um, in the areas of agriculture, uh, Minnesota is a breadbasket uh, massive farms in the south uh, where my campus is, energy, engineering, healthcare, information technology, manufacturing, and transportation. And those centers of excellence are appointed at one college. I am a agriculture center of excellence and uh, we support other schools. And so I support all of the other colleges in southern Minnesota. Um, to make sure they're looking at the greatest tools, what's going on in agriculture, 
um, what do we need to address throughout the state of Minnesota. So here's South Central College. Um, for credit, the students that are coming to get a degree, 5,000. Their average age is 29.1. So you can see, it's very different. Um, a student could come to my school and be in class with someone that's 16, someone that's 30, someone that's 60 in the same classroom, okay? Um, because they work, some part-time, some full-time. Um, I wanted you to see that farm business management is kind of like entrepreneurship. We help farmers, and my college supports 585 farms throughout southern Minnesota. And we do everything from their books, we tell them what their yield's gonna be for their crop, what their estimates are gonna be, et cetera. We also support um, uh, any, ch um, we've got a lot of um, sustainable farming going on, like aquaponics and, um, we've, and different things like that going on. Um, but my corporate training, the stuff I do with businesses, um, I wanna point out, is two and a half times the students that walk in for a degree, okay? I served 778 businesses last year for a total of 220,000 hours. So that gives you a different picture of what we call the multiple missions. And that's the 2017 numbers. So this is a snapshot of some of the national partnerships that we have at South Central College I'm gonna talk a little bit about. The NSF, I should have uh, maybe uh, explained, is the National Science Foundation. Uh, the National Science Foundation um, uh, will fund things like exploratory research in the, in the North Pole, or they also um, will fund things like advanced technological education. So things like mechatronics. And uh, they, they um, will award also what you call national centers of excellence, like the state centers of excellence that support them. Uh, the automotive center that I mentioned that I ran in 14 states uh, was a National Science Foundation uh, grant. Right now, in, at South Central College, we have what we call IMEC, which is mechatronics. We have um, a ge geographic information uh, certificate, and then advanced manufacturing. Uh, we have a Department of Labor. This is the United States Department of Labor and Mechatronics. Um, we started our nursing with um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That was uh, in 2008 when, we, when the uh, world went through the financial crises. Um, people were being laid off, so community colleges are packed at that, those times, and we then get funds from the federal government to help people get back into the workforce, and that's what that did, was help us start nursing at South Central. Then the Trade Adjustment Act uh, is what we use to fund uh, what the, the strategies that came out of President Obama's task force uh, we call it the Minnesota Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. I'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. The American Association of Community Colleges helped us align industry-recognized credentials called right signals. How do you know um, if a student has the skills that they need for a job? Um, we send the right signals. Um, and some computer integrated manufacturing. We recently received uh, funding from the Aspen Institute um, that is a philanthropic organization of corporations that look at the best community colleges in the country. And we received a Siemens Foundation grant for um, computer integrated machining. This is the, how we spread out that advanced manufacturing partnership throughout Minnesota. There's 12 of our um, 
state community colleges here um, that were um, addressing manufacturing skills. Uh, we had a $15 million grant to do that work um, with those uh, uh, 12 schools and then two centers of excellence at um, Bemidji State University and Minnesota State University, Mankato. Um, and that grant is wrapping up right now, but what we did was we started apprenticeships. We aligned to national standards um, to give students pathways and make sure that they have the skills that, they, that the workforce was requiring, that, that industry requires. Um, it looks a little weird, I didn't mention earlier, that this little piece here really just fits in there, and it's, it's kind of where the biggest population is in um, Minnesota, it's uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Here's um, a look at what industry recognized credentials could look like in a community college using a career pathway model. It starts with adults here that will test and take, if they don't need this, uh, if they do not need this content here, they can test out of it through credit for prior learning, but it's stackable credentials with different entry and exit points. It's important to know that um, they could just go out if they're just gonna be, let's say it's, this is machining, and they only need uh, to be an operator and they don't need advanced skills, they would get certified or credentialed here and stop out, but they could come back in at any point, complete this, complete this, they can decide that I want to continue on and, and go to the university in engineering, supervision, or design. Okay? So it was built is what we call in the United States stackable credentials with multiple entry and exit points. And you'll see that uh, laid out here in um, particular, this is laying out the courses or the content that the students would take. So 25 credits, you can go out here, you can continue on, take 39 more, you can continue on, and you would complete the 60 for a degree. And then they're all aligned to these industry standards. Then we went into right signals. We started with manufacturing when I got to South Central when this was a new thing for them. And then we, uh, they, they really grab, gravitated toward it. And so then we said, okay, let's take some more programs that direction. And we went with heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and then auto body and collision repair. And so now the college is beginning to understand, okay, we need to align to credentialing. We need to have multiple entry and exit points. Um, students should be able to transfer to the university if, if they so desire. So now it's, it's really gravitating and people are gravitating towards it. So the next step is, how do you recognize credit for prior learning, okay? Um, how do we as an institution say, I don't have to teach them everything. They may know things coming in, and how do I give them credit for it? And so as a state, we did this. I led this effort for the state uh, where we took all 37 institutions through it over a matter of three years. And so now they're all in. We took in, in round one, round two, round three. And um, they put through policies and practices to realize credit for prior learning. And what we developed from it is a businesses, business practice team, an online toolkit and resource team for all the institutions, and professional development for faculty and staff. Okay? Institutions in the United States have been saying they've been doing this for years, but how well are you doing it? We've institutionalized it now. And I'll show you a really great example in just a minute. And here's how we convince them to do it. Because it accelerates completion. It reduces duplication. 
It lowers the investment in education. You hear a lot about debt in education in the United States. They're more likely to graduate. You can recruit more adult students who may not otherwise enroll, okay? They persist at a higher rate. These are all proven facts through research through some of our philanthropic organizations that sponsor this work. Um, and one here, and I serve on this board, the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, Fueling the Race 2010, lays out all the facts. So our, our faculty found out, oh, well, my program's not gonna die because I give everybody credit. It's actually gonna increase. And it's gonna increase my persistence rates. It's very helpful to convince faculty. So now we're going after the people that in the past left us. I said people were, we were losing people. It's called Minnesota Reconnect. And the Lumina Foundation is uh, funding this. Uh, they funded four schools in Minnesota to go out and get the people that we did lose and get them back into school and get them back into work. And these students are actually going to be paid. So then the next strategy, everybody in the United States love our veterans, okay? And we've been in a lot of wars. They've been deployed multiple times, and now they're coming home. And so how do we get them educated? Um, they have learned some amazing things in the military that apply to many fields that we need that workforce. Because just like Europe, um, we, ha we have an aging population, um, and uh, we need those veterans to be a part of um, our workforce um, as we continue to look at how we um, um, stay strong. So um, we're a yellow ribbon college. Um, Minnesota's a yellow ribbon state. That means we have extra things to support our veterans, okay? So um, with this work, our veteran and service member um, increased by 56%, almost 57%. Uh, we uh, give them college credit at no cost. Um, we had 152 courses uh, recently mapped, this is just at South Central College, to 1,582 occupations in the armed services. Okay? We have a, a resource center for them, somewhere special that they can go, because some of them are, are dealing with um, um, uh, trauma, and uh, we, some of them have dogs to help keep them calm and those types of things, and uh, they need the wraparound services that we give them. Um, and we just pr provide, a, we have a student club for them, um, and they get additional benefits like no application fee, free transcripts, priority registration, their tuition is waived or deferred, okay? But I wanna show you how that works in Minnesota. In South Central College, when I arrived there, wasn't one of the progressive institutions with the veterans. We were yellow ribbon school because of the services, but the credits we weren't so good at until I showed them this. This is uh, run by the Minnesota State Colleges. We have a, a, a system office uh, in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, they created this site where a, a, a veteran, and we go out to the bases when they're getting ready to be um, released from the service before they come home, every Minnesotan veteran can go in, or armed service member, put in the branch of service, select the occupation they were in, the training dates, and their rank. And let's go on, once they hit go, it shows them how many college credits they'll get in each program, what award, degree, certificate, diploma, at what school. 
and there's pages of this. Okay? So when I showed South Central College, you're not in a database. Veterans aren't going to come to you. We increased. Okay? And what a skill. If they're a medic in the service, the only thing they might be lacking is infant CPR. Why would you hold them back? Teach them infant CPR and send them on into the workforce. We also support our veterans in agriculture. And this is funded by the Minnesota legislature. We have two programs funded through them. One's called Ag, Ag Spark Agronomy and Ag Spark Farm Business Management. Uh, we're promoting them into apprenticeships. We're promoting them into starting their own businesses, uh, some kind of sustainable agriculture. Um, we have a greenhouse now for them to go out and you know, just kind of relax and plant and, you know, maybe pull a couple of weeds, whatever they need to do out there. And uh, we use the food in our, in our culinary program. Uh, and we also provide it to some of our students that have financial need. Um, we've connected across uh, Minnesota uh, 1,300 veterans to this program. Um, and we have events for them. Um, it's kind of hard to see over here, but that's me. I'm doing some planting, planting some corn. And um, some of the biggest um, agriculture companies are in Minnesota. This is corn. I, I don't know if you, it doesn't look like popcorn, but it's corn. Um, and it's from um, one of the local co-ops. And the, the, um, it, there's a reason for the different colors. Uh, because of the, um, uh, some of the uh, GMOs and, and things in those seeds that um, the red ones are the ones that uh, the bugs would go to and the green ones are the ones that will actually yield some corn. So I want to talk a little bit about apprenticeship and this is an area that we've learned a lot from Europe. Um, we have, we've always had registered apprenticeships in the United States, but um, in recent, probably the last 20 years, they died off and now they're kind of coming back. Um, they're they're um, um, administered or, or they're given their journeyman's card through the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, so it has to be a partnership with them. We've set it up where um, our, our um, apprentices are getting um, wage increases throughout uh, their um, um, time, so if they complete six months uh, a year, they get incremental increases in salary. Uh, they, they're signed standards. Um, their journey worker um, is a national credential, so they can take that anywhere in the United States, and they have on-the-job mentors. Um, in the United States, we've had kind of a decline over the years in unions, um, and some people do not want to register an apprenticeship because they think that means union, and so we set up also what we call dual training. It's really the same thing, other than there's no agreement with the U.S. Department of Labor. They get a, a, a degree from the college. They don't get the journeyman's card, maybe. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't but very much uh, similar. Uh, but this was a way to get companies that just didn't like that name. Um, and just maybe to help you understand that, when I was in Kentucky, uh, it, it's a, in a southern state, a red state, and they just simply do not want unions there. Apprenticeship's not a good word, okay? It is in the Midwest and in the industrious states. It's changing. We called our apprenticeship Learn, Work, and Earn. And um, it's a, um, we also do it non-credit. So some employers are just having their employees go through that. And so um, in the funding streams here is coming from the Minnesota Department of Labor. We have what we call a pipeline project. 
that's where the state government pays the company for the mentor, and they get a tax break. And so that's really growing in Minnesota because of that. But here's what I wanted to spend a little more time talking about. Am I going too long? Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. Four minutes. Okay. Um, the latest uh, thing we created is telepresence. So we're doing apprenticeships via telepresence. Um, and we're doing it across the state. So it's live instruction that's a virtual classroom and, uh, and, and they could be one to three hours in length and um, it's run throughout the Minnesota state system. South Central College is leading it, but it's, uh, we, we work with our other un colleges and universities. And I wanna show you, because this is what it looks like. It's more realistic. And what we're doing is you could be in a, um, you could be at work, is the way we're setting it up with employers. And they have a breakout room and all they need is a computer. And two people could go in there and get instruction and they might be two people in 20 businesses around the state in there at the same time. Um, and it's made it um, workable for the employers. Uh, the they re the, the, um, the uh, students in the classes really enjoy it because they're not just learning from their own workplace, they're learning from other employers as well. And so uh, this is growing, and because of the way we offer it, um, it's very affordable. It's like $99 a class. And so we're doing this with what we call incumbent workers. These are people that are already working. Uh, we're doing it with people that are unemployed in workforce centers and then other people that are pursuing the degrees. And so um, I hope you um, enjoyed this. I do want to come back to the things that I said was important and show you a video that really struck me a couple of months ago. Um, and then that'll be the end of my presentation. So I'll head off the stage as that video's playing, so if you could start the video. 60 Minutes Overtime. The Media Lab started in the 1980s as an attempt to merge computers and the arts. This is at MIT. But it has grown explosively, and now today, more than 200 graduate students are bringing their craziest ideas to this place and are given free reign to try to engineer them. There are no rules at the Media Lab. Whatever you can envision pretty much falls under the guidelines of what the MIT Media Lab does. I first heard about this story when a great young producer named Katie Kurvstadt came to my office and said, you won't believe this thing that I found up in Boston at MIT. And I had frankly never heard of it. You look at the things that they accomplished there back in the 1980s, step-by-step -step driving instructions, developing a purpose for the touch screen. I was dying to get in there with Katie and see what they're coming up with for the next generation. What's the largest city in Bulgaria? and what is the population? Arnav Kapoor is a student. He's 23 years old from India. It's really exciting what he's working on. Sophia, 1.1 million. <laughs> that is correct. This is a device that you put on and it intercepts the electrical signals that your brain is sending to your vocal cords and sends that to a computer. And he gets the answer right in his ear through vibrations. You could be an expert in any subject. Mm -hmm. You have the entire internet in your head. That's the idea. What else should we do besides that? So Scott gets done interviewing Arnav, and uh, we decided to have a little fun. So are you telling me that you can order food without lifting a finger or saying anything? Let's do it, yeah. yeah. We want to order it. Surprise me. And he says, it's asking, what kind of toppings do you want? <laughs> want a cheese pizza? Pepperoni? Let's do some pepperoni pizza. Can it do pepperoni? Let's try. Let's try. You got ourselves pizzas. Get out of here. And he's like, okay, pizza's on his way. Should be here soon. We didn't really believe him. So we start packing up our gear, and lo and behold, he says, Katie, your pizza's here. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> we got pizza. <laughs> it's pizza delivered. 
without saying a word or lifting a finger. Pizza time. The first pizza. How's that? Ordered by. Oh, good. Thinking. It's very high tech. He's only been working on it for one year, so I can't imagine what this project will look like in another year. I was in a prosthetics lab where they're working on creating new limbs out of nuts and bolts and connecting them to the nerves and connecting them to the muscles to make them work. It's fascinating stuff. You feel directly connected, huh? Yeah, when I fire a muscle really fast, it makes its full sweep. Hugh Herr is a, a brilliant and charismatic guy who at the age of 17, while pursuing his love of mountain climbing, lost both of his legs. I, I really had a very vague picture of what my future would entail. I remember mo a moment with my father. He knew I wanted to return to my chosen sport of mountain climbing. And he told me, he said, if you want to do it, do it. There'll be a way. And he was right. He developed new legs for himself, went back to rock climbing, and now has made this his life's work to create prosthetics that are so integrated to the human body that he believes in the not distant future they will be able to eliminate all disabilities. Hugh Herr and his lab have developed many exoskeletons. The new one that they're working on, we decided to put Scott Pelley in. So this is a foot ankle exoskeleton and we're basically going to apply virtual muscles on the outside of your body. Our vision is that humans will wear crazy exoskeletal structures that will power walking and running and jumping. Able-bodied people will use these. Right. Why? Because legs are wonderful. I mean, there's a reason nature has given us legs, but we're not very efficient. Most of us, when we run, we breathe very hard. So exoskeletons can make it very easy to, to move, to run, and, and also with less stress in the body. Ready? Mm -hmm. OK. Go. The feeling of the exoskeleton that I was wearing is a little bit hard to describe. It's almost like something is kicking me in the heels. Mm -hmm. Yep, you feel more? A lot more. The arms behind him are the artificial calf muscle. It's a boost of power in his calves, and uh, it makes you feel a lot stronger. Because it's really now lifting my heels like my calf would, but my calf's not doing very much. They hope to make this autonomous so there's not all the wires and it's not hooked up to a computer. It's just propelling my feet forward, left, right, left, right. Uh, they're going faster, if you will, than I am mentally. <laughs> oh, that's remarkable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, that's a kick in the heels. <laughs> yeah.